Well, hello everyone, and welcome to a Devonian Traverse along Corridor H. This is an introduction to Stop 2, but also a little bit of an introduction to some of the Paleozoic strata that we'll see along the greater extent of the highway. Uh, one of the great things about Corridor H is that it spans all of the Devonian time. The rocks that you'll see along the stretch of the highway cover the Devonian in its entirety, and uh, you can piece together the outcrops in different places to see the entire uh, section. And um, here at uh, stop two, uh, we will see rocks that span the upper Mahantango formation, the Clearville member at the top of the Mahantango formation, all the way through the lower Hampshire formation. Uh, and that's really great. I'm gonna walk you through some of that. Um, but also later on at stop three, you'll see the top of the Helderberg, Helderberg Group limestones and up through the um, Needmore Shale. Um, and then later at stop four, we'll move a little bit further down in section and we'll see the Tenalaway limestone through uh, the lower part of the Helderberg Group, um, as well as all the way actually, all the way up into near the contact with the Oriskany sandstone. And then later at stop five, we'll go higher up in the section where you'll see the transition from the Hampshire into the Price Formation, and in particular, a very interesting member called the Rockwell member. But here at stop two, we're gonna focus on these rocks right here that include the Mahantango Formation, the Harold Shale, the Brailleur, and then an interval right in here, which is quite interesting. Um, and on this diagram, which was taken uh, from a USGS publication, there's a good reason why there's a question mark here at the contact between the Shear Formation and the Four Knobs Formation. And these two formations, they make up the Greenland Gap Group. And the reason that that question mark is in there is, um, well, there are a couple of reasons. Um, the first reason is when the Greenland Gap Group was first defined by John Dennison in 1970, he had used the Virginia, West Virginia state line as something of an arbitrary boundary for where the shear formation was actually uh, recognizable. And of course, uh, for someone like me who maps across state lines, that presents a problem when you're trying to make a seamless geologic map. We can't have a state line as a fault. So uh, this is uh, something I want to talk about when we look at the rocks here through the section exposed at stop two. It's a really great place to see it. The entire section is exposed and almost completely undeformed. Um, the other part of the problem when defining the shear formation and where it lies with respect to the overlying four knobs is, is what happens when weathering takes hold of the rocks. Now this, uh, this is a fairly fresh outcrop along corridor H down here but up here is where it has weathered away on an upper bench. And if you're out there mapping, it's almost hard to recognize any of these subtle sandstones that actually are kind of key in the definition of that shear formation. And I'll talk about that in a moment. So what are we gonna see along stop two? Uh, well, we'll start down here. Um, well, first of all, these are the um, formations that we'll see along the traverse. And we're gonna start down here in the upper Mahantango formation, again, the Clearville member. Um, we're gonna move right on up and see the overlying formation, which is called the Harrell Shale. Here it's not defined, it's a very thin unit, only about 15 meters thick. Um, but we'll see that in more detail in video number one. Next, we'll move up the section into the Brailleur where we'll take a look at some of these sandstone beds, the ones that were weathered out and uh, see them in more of their fresh state along the road cuts, um, and that will be described in video number two. After that, we'll move up to section to see the contact with the overlying four knobs formation, and uh, you'll see the sandstone there. That sandstone is actually called the Briary Gap Sandstone member and was defined by John Dennison in his initial definition of the four knobs. So we'll see it there. Uh, then we'll move up to a second prominent sandstone, which forms a mappable ridge for many, many miles. Um, it's called the Pound Sandstone Member. Both of these sandstone members actually are, are mappable across several states and form um, really great marker beds for finding the Four Knobs Formation. And that is all described in video number three. 
And next we'll go a little higher up and we'll see the transition out of the upper four knobs and into the Hampshire formation at uh, video number four, which continues further up the section all the way out into the uh, east limb of the Sidling Hill syncline, where we'll see some more video describing the transition into the terrestrial environment of the Hampshire formation. So what did perhaps the paleogeography of North America look like back in the Devonian when these rocks were deposited? Uh, well, here's one, uh, one rendering of the paleogeography by uh, Chris Gostis and, and others. Um, where Corridor H lies is where the Black Arrow is right here. So right on the edge of the uh, Acadian Mountains, and we're in the Appalachian Basin here. Look and see how it compares to these deeper basins out here and here. The Appalachian Basin really was not a very deep, deep water body, and the rocks actually are the, uh, the evidence of that. Um, so we'll take a look at the uh, section that was deposited at about 380 million years, which is when this paleogeographic rendering was, um, was made for, uh, we're right in the heart of the Franian stage of the Upper Devonian at about 380 million years. And um, the rocks, again, that we'll see exposed at Baker go from the, um, the Upper Mahantango in here through the four knobs. And, and uh, all of that deposition took place about a span of about 10 million years or so. Um, and uh, that is actually um, what was happening was the Akkadian orogeny was in full force. It actually took place in two separate pulses where land uh, island arcs or um, uh, other terrains were accreted onto the North American continent and collided and pushed these mountains up and a foreland basin over here was, was formed as a depression. And so sea level was rising and falling as the mountains were uh, being built. And the first uh, big pulse occurred down here uh, in the um, Middle Devonian. And then a second pulse occurred a little higher up, right at the start of the uh, Upper Devonian. Um, and so we'll be able to see evidence for those pulses in the rocks. The story really is one of sea level change. And this purple curve here is one I've just sketched in to show the relative sea level from low on this end going high to this end. Uh, and the facies that we see as the sea level changes through the rocks, the, the facies of the rocks that we, we see um, include the marine carbonate platform. In, uh, uh, that kind of depositional environment is where all of the Helderberg group and the Tenalaway formation were formed. Um, then sea level dropped precipitously. Uh, we had an erosional surface and then the Oriskany sandstone came in on top with another erosional surface. And that second erosional surface was basically um, the Wallbridge Unconformity, which you'll see at stop three. So the Oriskany represents something of a marine shoreline environment. Um, later, there was a marine basin on top of that that was formed and the incursion of, uh, of sea, uh, of a marine environment with uh, deeper water and the deposition of fine-grained shales. Uh, and then there was a hiatus uh, in the, at the top of the Mahantango Formation, which is where stop two begins, followed by a deepening of the basin again, in which uh, um, the Harold Shale was deposited, it's another fine grain black shale, and then a slow, slow shallowing, um, but over a course of fairly rapid deposition, um, where the Brailleur Formation was deposited, and then finally up into the marginal marine environment as sea level continued to drop where the Four Knobs Formation was deposited. And ultimately, there was some exposure. Uh, you can actually see some exposure surfaces in the uppermost Four Knobs, and we'll talk about that in the video, until you get to the fluvial deltaic environment of the Hampshire Formation. Now here, these red arrows are showing the two pulses of the Acadian orogeny, again, indicating a, a deepening of a foreland basin as the mountains were pushed up, the incursion of the marine environment and the deposition of dark shales. In this case, it's the Needmore and the Marcellus. And then a second pulse of mountain building occurred here with the deposition of the Harrell Shale as the basin deepened and then a lot of sediment filled in as those mountains were eroded off in the subsequent time periods. 
So if we just take a quick pick peek at a, uh, a cartoon of what a clastic dominated shoreline might have looked like or some of the, um, the kinds of depositional environments we might have expected, um, here's, a, here's a, pretty good, a pretty good diagram to illustrate that. Now, what we won't see here at Baker and at this section is any kind of limestone deposition. So this was a, um, a really uh, uh, not a conducive environment, let's just say, for the deposition of carbonate. Um, and in this image, as if you can imagine sea level here dropping over time, what that ends up being is a regressive sequence. Now this is showing a stack of transgression. And so what we're gonna end up with with sea level drops is actually the opposite going down. So we get a regressive sequence this way where you have shelf muds and shale uh, eventually overlain by a beach sandstone, which is eventually overlain by fluvial sands and mudstones in the case of the Hampshire. And so in, in some uh, general sense, we can identify these facies with these different rock formations that we'll see, the Brailleur, the Four Knobs, and the Hampshire as the sea level was dropping. And in this diagram, those would be sort of represented by zones like this. So the Brailleur formation would have been deposited in a very shallow shelf um, zone, maybe the delta front of some streams that were um, not represented in the, in the, the, the depos deposits of the Brailleur very well. Far enough away from shore that you're getting fine-grained sands, uh, in turbidity currents that are coming out, but nothing strong enough that would be indicating a, a, a submarine turbi turbidity current into a deeper basin. So still a shallow shelf environment. Um, and then as that, uh, uh, that depositional environment um, eventually shallowed, um, we would see the deposition of the Four Knobs Formation where the sands uh, and gravels derived from the high source lands of the Acadian Mountains off to the east um, are finally being intermixed with these um, finer grain shelf deposits. And so you progressively see increasing amounts of sand through the Brailleur until finally you see conglomeratic sands in the Four Knobs. And as you move out of the Four Knobs, you, you get uh, occasional tidal flat environments that are exposed and then flooded again with a marine environment and then exposed until finally you're in the Hampshire with complete uh, terrestrial delta flat exposure. And uh, we'll talk about the sediments and we'll look at the rocks and we'll see what kind of evidence we have for all those environments.